Well, how can it even theoretically exist on Earth where everything is virtually matter and whatever you try to contain it with would be matter? Yeah, that's the problem. Uh, right now, we can create uh, beams of antiprotons in a vacuum and then combine them with anti-electrons coming from a radioactive source called sodium-22. And we get anti-hydrogen. So this has been done in the laboratory. We have actually created uh, small quantities of anti-hydrogen gas. If the anti-hydrogen gas combines with ordinary matter, then of course it, uh, you know, uh, immediately annihilates. However, these are infinitesimal quantities. Uh, you would have to do this in outer space. Uh, in outer space, you would have to have a laboratory uh, sufficient to create beams of these things, uh, which would not interact with matter. But then, you know, you would have to put it into a bottle of some sort, right. a container, right. so that you don't blow yourself up uh, before the thing, uh, before the bomb does. Uh, with plutonium, you do this by having subcritical masses or subcritical pieces of uranium. The Hiroshima bomb, for example, uh, basically looked like Pac-Man, a, a large piece of uranium with a pie piece taken out, and you shot the pie piece into the larger assembly, and, you, and the subcritical pieces went supercritical. Mm. So that's how the Hiroshima bomb worked. Uh, it basically looked at uh, a gun principle based on shooting a Pac-Man uh, pie piece into the larger Pac-Man. But, however, an uh, antimatter bomb simply would disintegrate as soon as you form it. Do you remember uh, in, what was it, Fat Man and Little Boy or whatever it was, in the, in the movie about the making of the bomb? That's right. Um, do, you, do you remember that scene in the, um, in the lab where uh, somehow they made a mistake and they got, and I guess this is all a true story, and they got critical masses too close together? That's right. And, uh, and away she went, and he was radiation poisoned, died a terrible death, and all the rest of it in the making of the bomb. Well, was that essentially what we're talking about here, the size of the mass and how close it gets and all that? Uh, that's right. Two people were actually blown apart and were killed at Los Alamos. Uh, one was uh, killed one month after the bombing of Nagasaki. Uh, they had the plutonium on a tabletop, believe it or not. They had the atomic bombs. Uh, how, much, how much of it, Doctor? Uh, again, about the size of your fist. They had two okay. hemispheres of plutonium, and Harry Daglian, a 26-year-old worker, walked into the room where they had this atomic bomb sitting on the tabletop, and he tripped. He tripped, and his shoulder hit the tungsten carbide, which was surrounding the plutonium. The tungsten carbide fell into this mass, reflected the neutrons, concentrated the neutrons, and critical mass was attained right in his face. So we have to realize that uh, a small atomic bomb went off right in front of Harry Daglian's face. Well, there, well, there was um, an actual physical explosion, uh, because they didn't show that, of course, in the movie. They just showed the, the radiation going off scale and stuff. Was there actually any physical notable reaction, or was it all radiation? It was all radiation. All radiation? A blue flash of light called Serenkov radiation. Oh, there was. There was a blinding blue flash of light called Serenkov radiation of neutrons. Uh, Harry Daglin was hit with about 5,000 rads of radiation. Wow. Uh, that is an enormous amount of radiation. That's ten times uh, what's necessary. He got a tremendous dose of radiation, and he died in the Los Alamos hospital within a matter of uh, days to weeks. I assume he knew what had just, you know, I mean, he knew he was a dead man walking. Uh, that's right. He didn't feel a thing. He didn't feel a thing, even though he, every cell in his body was being ripped apart. Except intellectually, he, he could read the meters. Uh, that's right. He lost consciousness after um, uh, about an hour or so. And then his body basically disintegrated. Uh, in, you know, radiation burns all over his body. There are autopsy reports published of this, which I have. Huge blisters uh, occurred over his body. And then just a few months later, believe it or not, um, in 1946, uh, Louis Slotin, a physicist, was blown apart in the same way. He had two hemispheres of plutonium on a tabletop. He had an atomic bomb on the tabletop with a screwdriver. Uh, the screwdriver would bring these two hemispheres closer and closer and closer together. A Geiger counter needle would go off scale, and then he would untwist, unscrew the two hemispheres. Uh, this is called tickling the dragon's tail. <laughs> Slowly with a screwdriver, bringing two subcritical pieces of plutonium, which could detonate as an atomic bomb. 
In fact, uh, as far as we know, that same mass of plutonium was, in fact, detonated in the Pacific. That, could, that, that actually could, could have happened on the tabletop. Now, it was always my understanding from, again, from the movies, where else would I get it, that you had to create a TNT-type or level explosion to slam these two pieces. But that's if you want to release uh, 20,000 tons of TNT. If you just want to set off criticality, that is, have a blinding blue flash and basically fry anybody in the room, yes. you could do that by bringing them together with a screwdriver. Yeah, right. All right. Uh, the next question would be, didn't they at that time understand enough of the theory to understand what they were doing to themselves, potentially? I mean, they had to know. They considered themselves hot rodders. Uh, they were pushing the laws of physics. Uh, they were making measurements. And when, when Slotin realized that he had turned the screw too many times uh, and the guy with the needle went off scale, he lunged forward and with his bare hands, with his bare hands, he separated the two plutonium hemispheres and he took the entire brunt of the atomic bomb in his chest. Oh, my God. And he was, again, hit with about 5,000 rads of radiation. He, too, pretty much disintegrated uh, with enormous burns over his body uh, at the Los Alamos Hospital. Well, uh, Professor, he wouldn't have been informed enough about the tail tickling uh, to, to, the not, to not do this? Well, this was an accident. Uh, he knew that if you brought the two hemispheres too close together, the neutrons would hop across, yes. and subcritical mass would become supercritical. However, he never expected that he would make a mistake. Um, there was a beryllium cup reflector. Uh, he made a mistake with regards to turning the screw too much with the, with the reflector. Too many neutrons were going back and forth between the two hemispheres, fissioning the plutonium atom and it went super critical in its face. Uh, believe it or not, uh, seven Americans have been literally blown apart in super criticality accidents. Seven Americans? Seven Americans. You, you often hear that no one's ever died in a nuclear accident. That's baloney, huh? Which is baloney, because I have the autopsies of many of these individuals. Uh, we physicists to study these things, because we have to understand what happens when reactors blow up and what happens when bombs explode in your face. And, uh, again, these same hemispheres of plutonium apparently were detonated in the Pacific as an atomic bomb. Sure. But, but again, back in the lab, Professor, uh, how wide a geographic swath of the kind of radiation that killed them was created? Um, in other words, people in the same room, people in adjacent, adjacent rooms, or could it have been much worse getting them closer together? Uh, something that, would, for, for example, would have um, killed everybody on the base that they were experimenting. Well, luckily, um, both incidences uh, had the plutonium coming together very slowly. Uh, one, because of the, the heating of a tungsten carbide block, and the second one, because a screwdriver was turned too much. Yes. And so in the room, there were several people watching this demonstration by Lewis Lawton. Uh, each of them got a pretty hefty dose of radiation, but all of them survived, except for Lewis Lawton himself, who, as I said, uh, disintegrated in the hospital. But the other individuals got a heavy dose of radiation, but there were no side effects. They were far enough from the plutonium so that uh, they survived. Um, when I was a graduate student, by the way, in physics, we heard rumors about this incident, and we were told that in the first week, the first row died, in the second week, the second row died, in the third week, the third row died, according to the Indra Square Law. Uh, that's not true. Um, I looked up the report. And the only person who died was Louis Slotin in this second incident.